Good morning, everyone, and welcome to one more lecture of liver diseases. In the previous lecture, we had done um, trauma of the liver, and in this lecture, lecture, what I we will be doing is the we will talk about the liver abscess and tumors. And in tumors, we will talk about both the benign and the malignant tumors. So. Uh, to start with, if you'll see over here, even in the slide, there's a lot of information about the liver anatomy, uh, which we had gone through in the previous lecture. Like yesterday when I start the lecture, the, my last lecture, uh, which was on liver trauma, uh, I talk about the blood supply of the liver, the functional division of the liver, uh, the <coughs> biliary tract, and all those things, right? So, starting from liver abscess, now, uh, we know what is abscess, right? Abscess is the collection of pus in a cavity. And just leaving the anterior chamber of the eye, abscess anywhere in the body, no matter it's in the brain, no matter it's in the liver, no matter it's in the bone, anywhere, whenever there is any abscess in the body, the only way to treat is incision and drainage. Or in simple words, we have to drain the abscess. <laughs> you can see like in this one, you know, there is a, they are showing the abscess. So, liver abscess, of course, when the abscess is in the liver. Now, here they are talking about how the bacteria can reach into the liver. So, it could be through portal vein, it could be through biliary duct, and it could be due to uh, by hepatic artery. <clears throat> okay, so portal vein, of course, like abdominal infections, can seed secondarily to the liver. Uh, that makes sense. If you will talk about the biliary duct, like if you, in medicine, you we have done cholangitis, or something called as ascending cholangitis. So. Ascending bacterial colon, uh, infection of the biliary tract can um, spread to the liver. And uh, how we diagnose and all these things, of course, we'll talk later. And the third thing is hepatic artery. Uh, like any infection in the blood can reach the liver through the, through the hepatic artery, right? So... Uh, or there are other ways, you know, subphrenic infections or open liver injury, congenital hepatic cyst, secondary infection or cryptogenic liver abscess. And the characteristics are like it could be single, it could be in the right lobe, left lobe, it could be multilocular, like or you can say the classification, how we can classify. Okay, so now <coughs> whenever there is any abscess in the liver, uh, it will it can present um, um, it can present clinically um, of course like first of all fever the chills and rigors and there could be pain in the upper right upper quadrant and the pain can be a dull type of pain. Uh, the pain could be referred to the right shoulder and, or, or back and constitutional symptoms like systemic symptoms. Nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite and fatigue which are, which are the symptoms of any infection in the body. Okay. And whenever we go for the physical examination, of course, one of the two of the things which we can found one is 
uh, you can you can get hepatomegaly or you can found tetanus in that area okay so the thing over here is like uh, uh, one of the thing which we call it as pyogenic liver abscess and uh, one of the thing we call it as amoebic liver abscess and there is one disease called as hydrated liver disease now uh, all the three like uh, okay uh, if I will show you over here um, if I'll show you over here like liver abscess right or see this one is a pyogenic abscess so pyogenic abscess <laughs> uh, you can say like it is more common in immunocompromised people and the clinical features will remain same yeah like you know what I told you fever chills rigors pain and all this stuff right or up right upper quadrant discomfort so of course like I'm not repeating the clinical features again and again but remember that it's hydrated cysts it's amoebic cysts it's pyogenic abscess whatever like clinical features will be more or less same right so <clears throat> Uh, many of the people as you can see over here they have comorbidities old age you know they have cirrhosis chronic renal failure or history of malignancies whatever okay uh, now the important thing over here is to discuss is uh, mm, <clears throat> how we diagnose right so, okay, we can do the blood investigations, okay, like uh, there could be leukocytosis, of course the infection is going on so maybe you can find leukocytosis and the F LFTs can come back as abnormal and the patient can present with joint as even trans aminases like ALT and AST can be raised in these patients so what is this thing right we will go for the labs and we can do that th these things but also uh, one more thing uh, which we can do is to see the structure of the liver like I was talking about yesterday uh, how we can see the structure of the liver so we will go for imagings, right? And in imagings, of course, we can, we can go for ultrasonography. Uh, we can go for a, a CT scan. X-rays are not so helpful, but uh, can like can be done. You can see over here, like here, they are showing the X-rays, right? So plain abdominal X-ray demonstrating an abnormal collection of air in the upper quadrant of the liver. So it is a pyogenic liver abscess or over here right whatever it be so but the best thing is of course we will go for ultrasonography we will go for a CT scan uh, that's the best thing to check the structure of the liver or to check the tissue of the liver right so you can see as you can see over here on ultrasonography they are showing you how liver abscess looks like or or CT scan which will give quite a better picture, right? And one of the thing, remember guys, whenever there is any pus collection, so uh, we must take samples from that one. Um, most probably can be done uh, by aspiration, uh, percutaneous aspiration, and uh, we can collect the samples and we can send it to the labs uh, for culture and sensitivity right before starting antibiotics so of course like once you know okay what kind of organism is there so that would make the things better right 
<laughs> so this is how we approach, right? Now, what is the treatment of these kind of uh, abscesses is uh, uh, simply incision and aspiration or incision is drainage and drainage is the first thing we have to do, right? And of course, once you have done that, then you will give them antibiotics. But how, when you can give antibiotics when you know the organisms? So the organisms which are involved in biogenic abscess can be Streptococcus miliary and E. coli. But sometimes, you know, it could be Streptococcus faecalis or Klebsiella, things like this. Like mixed growths are mostly seen. So remember in treatment, number one thing is, of course, drainage. We will do uh, drainage, okay, like in surgery, they use a the term IND, like incision and drainage. But nowadays, you know, uh, these kind of incisions and drainage are better done by percutaneous aspirations, okay? Like from the skin, they can, uh, under, look, you can see over here, this is the ultrasound probe and this one is a syringe. So, this ultrasound will guide the needle uh, to the uh, collection of the pus and then you know that could be aspirated taken out right so uh, you can see over here they they reached that site right um, <clears throat> so this thing and of course like ultrasound guided aspiration can be done or uh, uh, whatever like the, the point is to drain that right <laughs> and after that, after that, of course, we will choose the antibiotics. So once we know the name of the organism, of course, uh, penicillins can be given with metronidazole uh, because, you know, E. coli. And so uh, basically, you know, uh, most of the time because the mixed growths are seen. So the best combination is penicillins with aminoglycosides uh, with uh, metronidazole or uh, you can say you can use in penicillin allergic people you can use other antibiotics like uh, fluoroquinolones or macrolides antibiotics like this but uh, a very good combination is basically starting the patient on third generation phallosporins with uh, metronidazole uh, that is the treatment which is given to these patients. So this is one of the thing and uh, after that one of the thing is called as amoebic abscess. Now amoebic abscess, uh, you know the name of that organism that is called as ant amoeba histolytica and this is the, this uh, uh, parasite will basically have worldwide distribution and uh, many people, uh, they get this infection, they present with um, diarrhea, chronic type of diarrhea. And simply that thing can go in the liver and can cause, can form an amoebic cyst. So, this is very common, right? And uh, uh, I have one lecture in parasitology about all these things, you know, antimibia histolytica. Uh, now, the, the important thing to remember in this one, guys, like is uh, uh, simply uh, uh, anyone who have this amoebic cyst, you know, we start them on. Uh, this is like the the the... Uh, people, how they present, like, see, percentage of people who present with abdominal pain, fever, abdominal tendons, and things like this. No need to remember, like, the features, clinical features remain somehow same. 
even the diagnostic things are is the same like ultrasonography or uh, CT scanning plus other labs which we discuss in pyogenic liver abscess you know they can be done okay so um, um, you can see over here uh, this is like uh, <clears throat> the features of amoebic versus pyogenic abscess <laughs> the age male to female ratio and single versus multiple location exposure to the endemic areas diabetes alcohol use jaundice elevated bilirubin like all the things yeah. you can see like jaundice is very uncommon in amoebic abscess whereas it is common in pyogenic abscess Okay, the treatment remains him. Once the diagnosis is done, and how we diagnose, of course, we are going to take the samples. We will see under the microscope, uh, and if the, they can found anything by histolytica, so it's showed like it's an amoebic abscess. And the treatment is metronidazole, and it is given. You can say seven hundred fifty milligram orally, three times daily for ten days, right? So <clears throat> that that gave very good results. You can see, ninety percent of the patients they they respond. Some of the patients who don't respond, we investigate them more. So this is how it is done. And of course, like aspiration in those who fail to respond on metronidazole therapy therapy in three to five days and abscesses larger than five centimeter in diameter should be aspirated okay. and of course like if you will not treat you know they can rupture they can cause compression of the inferior vena cava and even they can they can the, the patients may have brain abscess because the blood from the liver will go to the heart and from heart it can practically go anywhere so that's why so this thing one of the thing is hydrated liver disease as well but uh, uh, that is caused by tapeworm echinococcus granulosus and uh, that would be treated in the same way how we discussed like we will do same investigations, same structural and uh, assessment of the liver, and the same treatment is there. But uh, remember, like whenever it is caused by parasites, so the best treatment is to give anti helminths or you can say anti parasitic drugs like albendazole, mebendazole, drugs like this. And why we are studying all the things in surgery? Because simply, uh, surgery is done in the cases when the things cannot be controlled by medications, right? Okay. So that's pretty much about... Uh, liver abscess and now we will go for um, tumors of the liver okay so <clears throat> sorry like this one is like I'm opening a wrong slide by the way I must open this one first right okay so okay like when you will get, get the slide of course you can see, see these things right uh, talking about the liver tumors, you know, uh, of course, tumors, whenever we study, um, there could be benign or malignant and malignant can be primary or secondary. Of course, secondary malignant tumors means what, like those who came by metastasis, right? So, of course, we are not concerned about this one because uh, any type of carcinoma can give metastatic tumors, right? or can metastasize to, to liver. 
So our main emphasis will be on primary liver tumor or primary liver cancer, right? One thing is this one and the other thing is the benign tumors. Now, if I will talk about the benign and the malignant tumors, you know, benign tumors are not so common. And uh, not so common means like they are rare or malignant ones are most common, simply. So now, the liver uh, the liver may, may have any kind of conditions like infections, you know, hepatitis or there could be vascular tumors even like hemangiomas. So that's why, you know, whenever we talk about the uh, liver lesions, you know, we classify them as solid or cystic, single or multiple. Sometimes they are classified according to the cells of origin like uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, or cholangio carcinoma uh, or the one which is in front of you like benign and malignant right uh, yes one more thing you know i wanted to talk about here is you know liver cyst of course like they are also to you like cyst is a different thing because cyst is defined as a collection of the fluid lined by the epithelium so hepatic cysts are very common, okay. Hepatic cysts are common. Sometimes they can be congenital, sometimes they can be secondary to trauma. Uh, in that case, they are called as seroma or biloma, or can be result due to as a result of infections, okay. So, cysts are quite common. So, uh, Uh, to start with, uh, by the way, uh, you know, uh, you can like I told you yesterday that you can you can learn about what is a rooftop incision, right? So basically, you know, liver can be approached surgically by by rooftop or transverse abdominal incisions, right? Because they they give a good approach to the liver. Okay, so no matter if you are doing a surgery for a cyst for a benign tumor for a malignant tumor or for an abscess whatever if abscess require an open surgery then we use these kind of incisions and uh, to des describe all the procedure is not possible and it's better to watch a movie in which they are talking about like what they are doing either they are uh, where is falciform ligament and uh, where is inferior vera cava and all the things, right? So that would be easy, easy to remember things. So uh, simply, uh, liver surgeries are done for the, these. And whenever, whenever they do uh, liver surgeries, by the way, what they do is like, either they have to take out just that mass, number one. Number second, either they have to uh, remove a lobe or either they have to remove a segment or either they have to remove a functional unit of the liver uh, that completely uh, depends on uh, you can say the surgeon's uh, decision right so uh, the, 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 the surgeons decide what could be what best could be done in that case okay <laughs> okay. Uh, I will talk a little about uh, uh, benign tumors. For example, one of the benign tumor is called as uh, hemangiomas. Hemen hemangiomas. Hemangiomas or hemangioma, right? So, hemangiomas are the most common solid benign masses. Okay. Now, as the name shows, hemangioma, so angio means vessel, right? And he means blood. So, hemangiomas, like the thing is clear. 
remember that they are vascular lesions that contain fibrous tissue and small blood vessels which which are growing and oma means you know a mass or tumor and they are more common in women and they can be very small as a 1 cm to very giant like 10 to 25 cm in size okay so now uh, if you will think logically right and we are talking about benign tumor we are talking about hemangioma we are talking about a tumor which is basically a tumor formed of blood vessels right and as it is benign it is it does it does not uh, you can say uh, metastasize yes it can grow in size so what what could be the clinical features in this case simply the clinical features will be um, same clinical features of pyogenic or uh, like abscess re uh, remove the signs and symptoms of infection like of course there will be no fever but yes there will be pain okay and if the tumor will increase in size um, it cause pressure it can rupture it can bleed so depending on what's the size of the tumor either it is bleeding or not the symptoms will be according to that and the the thing is what how we diagnose them again they do something called as biophasic CT scan okay they, they do a biophasic CT scan or a MRI simply and they like on those they can see they can look at the locations of the tumor and then they can plan for the surgery okay so this is like uh, uh, what is done in that case so other than hemangiomas uh, uh, there could be they may, they may have uh, adenomas okay like one of the uh, primary uh, tumors of the liver uh, or you can say a benign primary right uh, could be adenomas now this is so disturbing by the way I'm not good in PPT things uh, okay so now I told you hemangiomas are common adenomas are not so common okay but they are solid tumor they are benign tumors and they are mostly seen in young women uh, around 20 to 40 years of age so and remember something which is seen only in females uh, you know it is it has some connection with the hormones for example adenomas is also more prevalent in the females who are who, who use oral contraceptives and what oral, oral contraceptives have oral contraceptives contain estrogens and using estrogens estrogens have a clear cut association with developing of hepatic or liver adenomas okay but it's not like this like only those females get this thing which take oral contraceptive of course some of the females they can also get it without the history of using contraceptives or estrogens of course because estrogen is present in females anyways so when we uh, you know like during surgery how they look like they are soft and their color is tan or light brown color and uh, then of course we take the sample of them and we send it to the lab and they see it under the microscope they see what are the shape of the cells what are the type of the cells so mostly adenomas they lack bile duct glands they lack kuffer cells if you know you know kuffer cells are present in the liver and uh, 
these adenomas don't have lobules and they appear congested due to glycogen deposition. So simply like how to diagnose them again the same story we will run the investigations to see the uh, structure of the liver like uh, a CT scan or MRIs right and simply uh, uh, hepatic adenomas they carry risk of rupture and that's the reason any patient who have uh, uh, who is diagnosed with adenoma sometimes they present with spontaneous intraperitoneal hemorrhage like they started bleeding so uh, and some of the hepatic uh, adenomas can can change into hepatocellular carcinoma this is one of the things to remember right the treatment is simply surgical resection. So, uh, uh, one of the last one which I wanted to talk about in benign one, of course, like after that I will uh, move on to the hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, uh, like the primary one is uh, like the benign one, last one is focal uh, nodular hyperplasia. Uh, now to uh, simply tell you what is this one, this is also solid, it's a benign lesion and this is also common in females. Remember all these tumors are more common in females. And this one is also linked to estrogen usage. But association with estrogen adenomas are more famous than this one or they have more strong association than this one. So simply, of course, like uh, we will, when we will take the samples and we will send to the lab and then they, they will see under the microscope, then we could differentiate between either it's a focal nodular hyperplasia uh, or either it's this one. Okay. And you know, one of the things to remember in these two is what, what like any female who's diagnosed with adenomas or focal nodular hyperplasia and they are taking oral contraceptive pills, we stop them. Okay. So that's all. Okay. Uh, maybe in other surgical in surgery books maybe you will found a lot of other primary tumors um, um, like but of course they are very rare no need to go into much detail of them okay uh, rather just make like the, the good concepts right okay so now uh, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about hepatocellular carcinoma okay uh, which is the primary liver cancer right so malignant tumors in the liver I, as I told you can be classified as primary which originate from the liver or secondary or metastatic which comes from other places and uh, primary one is called as hepatocellular carcinomas or hepatonomas but they are more commonly called as hepatocellular carcinomas and when the cancer arises from the bile ducts, so it is called as cholangiocarcinoma. So uh, we will discuss a little about HCC. Okay, in this slide you can see like uh, they have given some um, epidemiological data about this one and also in China. Okay, what is the condition? Okay. Uh, now, you know, in many of the MCQs questions, they, they, they do ask some questions. There are some bad questions which come from this topic. Uh, I will tell you when uh, I will talk about them. So, <laughs> you know, one of the questions which they usually ask is, uh, a major risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma is, is in the patients who have hepatitis B and C. Also, people who use alcohol for a long period of time or the, those who develop alcoholic cirrhosis, then hemochromatosis in which like there is abnormal iron metabolism and people who are using anabolic steroids and aflatoxin. So, now, uh, it's not like this, like anyone who will get hepatitis B or C, they will... They definitely will develop this one, but of course, many of these patients they can develop, and it is more associated with hepatitis B rather than C. Okay. In people who develop cirrhosis, the conversion rate to hepatocellular carcinoma 
is around 3 to 6 percent per year. So now um, you can see over here they are talking about the pathology okay and uh, take we can divide it according to the tumor size okay <laughs> now um, the thing is quite simple by the way um, I'm just thinking like I teach you any carcinoma until yet or not but uh, there's, a, there's a way to, to remember carcinomas by the way like not the way to remember carcinomas like uh, how we proceed with the carcinoma patient simply uh, we go for investigations to diagnose first then there is investigation to confirm then there is investigations to stage them and then there could be uh, things like what I mean, there are a few things like uh, according to staging we decide either surgery can be done or not or we must uh, give them chemotherapy or radiotherapy or hormonal therapy whatever right anyhow uh, uh, many of the patients they are middle age and they present with these symptoms okay like uh, weakness abdominal pain anorexia weight loss okay sometimes joined us, SITs and all those things, right? So a lot of things are done, right? But of course, depending on the condition of the liver, uh, uh, they can present with any of these, right? Okay, so now um, the important thing to tell you about this one is once we diagnose anyone with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and how we diagnose, of course, Patient presented with uh, um, weight loss, malaise, joinders, um, anorexia, they have the history of Averroes B and C and what happened, the doctors run many investigations, they get the imaging studies like CT scan and MRI and they found that okay they have some mass in their liver. And once they have found the mass in the liver, what they are going to do? They are going to send that mass for the histopathology. The histopathology guy confirm, okay, it is hepatocellular carcinoma. Then we will do the staging. And TNM staging is used T for tumor and for nodes and for metastasis. So if metastasis is present, see M1, otherwise M0. If regional nephrons are involved, N1. Uh, if they, they are not involved and zero and according to tumor size we stage them as t1 t2 t3 and t4 right and uh, one of the thing which we uh, do use for screening purposes in these patients is basically uh, there is something called as afp or alpha fetoprotein and we can measure it in the blood and in the patients who have the who have this thing is raised they may have hepatocellular carcinoma right so again these photos are for staging like stage one see less than two centimeter tumor you can see over here less than two centimeters t1 this is stage two of course the tumor size is increased okay then they give you the example of t3 and t4 right so greater than two centimeter type tumor bile over multicentric and it is invading a major vessel so you will see like t4 it's multiple one or greater than one low in which or major branch of portal or hepatic vein. So it is stage four, right? So of course, like this what this thing we can get on biopsy. So AFV will be raised. We can do ultrasonography, we can do CT scan, angiography, MRI, and ultimately biopsy. <coughs> okay. And uh, now, once you have run the investigations, you have diagnosed the patient with hepatocellular carcinoma. What's the treatment? This one, see, 
huge tumor compressing the inferior vena cava. Okay. So to tell you, any patient who have hepatocellular carcinoma, the surgical treatment is simply tumor resection with liver transplantation. So one thing is tumor resection and the other thing is liver transplantation, right? And this completely depends on the size of the tumor, on the site of the tumor, and uh, on metastasis. And of course, either the donor is available or not. Okay. So, liver section indications, see when the patient condition is good, the tumor is localized. Okay. And uh, there is no cirrhosis. The liver functions are compensated and there is no severe injuries of other organs. So, we can go for liver resection. So, sometimes patients with advanced cirrhosis, they can do extensive liver resection as well. But of course, the mortality is high. So, uh, again, like these are the things, you know, like the tumor must be confined to the liver without distant metastasis or extension to the hepatic or portal veins. And the lesion must be entirely resected by local excision, lobectomy, and extended lobectomy, right? And these are the contraindications for surgical resections. So, one thing is surgical resection, and the other thing is just transplantation. So, of course, you know, a lot of things are mattered in this case either a donor is available like availability of the donor is the biggest uh, hurdle in this thing you can say surgically whenever they remove a tumor like if the patient is meeting all this criteria which I show you then what they do is like they resect the tumor with one to two centimeter of the margins okay in that case, undissectable tumors, we use they use ligation or embolism of hepatic artery with or without chemotherapy. Okay, so this thing and uh, a child book score, which I told you, is basically preoperative assessment of liver function, and then they decide like either they have to go for it or don't go for that. Okay, so I leave this thing. I don't think so. It will help you. Okay, there are other things which are available. Okay, liver transplantation is a big game, okay? Of course, like, we have done transplantation, so you know what is that. Okay, and then followed by, it is followed by the chemotherapy, systemic chemotherapy using 5 fluorouracil and there are many other options as well. Or uh, there is something called as arterial chemoembolization. It is also called as TACE. It is trans arterial, uh, trans arterial uh, chemo embolization. Okay, TACE. So through the artery, this gives some chemicals to embolize that area. Liver cancer blood mostly from the hepatic artery combines selective hepatic arterial injection of cancer chemotherapeutic agents with embolization. Okay, and then. Uh, there is something called as PEA which is percutaneous ethanol ablation in which like percutaneously they give ethanol to ablate that area destroy that area and radiotherapy is used in some of the patients uh, who have fair conditions okay without cirrhosis joined as SITs okay all this one so many of the radi radiotherapy agents can be used this is ethanol injection, which I'm telling you, which is called as PEA, percutaneous ethanol ablation. Okay. Okay.
Nowadays, newer medications are available. Now, this one is sorafenib. Sorafenib is a newer medication. You can read about that. It's very, very, very expensive. Okay. And it just increase a survival rate a little. You can see over here. This is placebo group and this is the sorafenib group. And secondary tumors, of course, they come from breast, lungs, pancreas, stomach, large intestine, kidney, ovaries, uterus. They reach to the liver by systemic suppletion, portal vein, lymphatics, and uh, all this way. So, of course, like anyone who has cancer, guys, uh, secondary tumors, we don't cover much because uh, of this thing, because, like, you know, these are cancers which are already metastasized. So, the same clinical features can be present, same laboratory can be done, imaging can be done, and the decision should be taken according to the tumor size, metastasis, patient condition, patient mor morbidity, more uh, like, uh, you can say condition overall, because these patients, you know, they have some cancer, so, of course, like, their condition is all already, you can say, uh, not so good so that is a decision taken by a group of you can say um, specialists not by one person at all right so you can say it's a group uh, which take the condition which take this decision of what is best for these this patient right okay so we, uh, we have discussed this one hepatic adenoma we have discussed uh, one of the tumor uh, Okay, we have discussed, this is like, again, one more slide, uh, talking about the same things, guys. Now, there is no difference. Uh, just like some of the tables are there, which I didn't show you, but you can go through them, right? Uh, you will not find anything new, uh, but some tables will be new. But with the same thing, things written like PEA, you can see over here, okay, which I already talked about and taste or thermal ablation, nitrogen ablation, all this stuff. Uh, one of the cancer is also called as cholangiocarcinoma. That is the uh, bile duct cancer. Um, and cholangiocarcinoma, uh, when we will study gallbladder, uh, I'll talk a little about that also. Okay, so... Yes, so that's all about uh, this primary liver cancer, okay, I hope you understand, and this cholangiocarcinoma is not so important, by the way, uh, HCC is important, so I will see you in the next lecture, right, bye.